Theistic evolution critique, methodological naturalism. We've been looking at the book uh, Theistic Evolution, a Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique, edited by uh, J.P. Moreland, Stephen Meyer, Christopher Shaw, Ann Gager, and Wayne Grudem. And today we'll be looking at a chapter that's written by Stephen Meyer and also uh, Paul Nelson. Interestingly, they have opposing views on the age of life on Earth, but um, they're able to cooperate in this book, and uh, you'll see them uh, writing clearly together. Um, before we go too much further, I'll point out the book is aimed at a very specific target, and it isn't atheism. There are several different ways you can put uh, the uh, science and religion data of creation together. You can go with young life creation of various stripes. You can go with what's traditionally called old earth but should be called old life creation. You can go with theistic evolution that is intelligent design friendly. That is to say, God did it. He did it very slowly. Um, but you can tell that his hand is in it. You can go with theistic evolution that is non-ID friendly. That is to say, God did it, but you can't tell by looking. It might as well have been atheistic, and then, of course, you can go with flat-out atheistic evolution. And most of us uh, have struggled with atheistic evolution, but this book is specifically written to deal with non-ID theistic evolution and is not intended, although I think sometimes we'll wind up in doing it anyway, to distinguish between the top three. This particular chapter is written by Stephen Meyer and Paul Nelson, and uh, it's in section two, The Philosophical Critique of Theistic Evolution, and it's entitled, Should Theistic Evolution Depend on Methodological Naturalism? Um, the summary, which is sort of like an abstract, uh, says nearly all theistic evolutionists say that some naturalistic process will eventually explain the origin of novel forms of life. They do so because they accept a philosophical rule known as methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism asserts that to qualify as scientific a theory must explain by strictly physical or material, that is non-intelligent or non-propulsive uh, causes. This chapter shows that as a supposedly neutral rule for how science should function, methodological naturalism fails. Nor can one rely on demarcation criteria devised to define science normatively. These criteria, which purport to distinguish science from pseudoscience or religion, die by a thousand counterexamples. The history of science includes many theories violating one or another allegedly necessary demarcation criterion, such as observability, explanation by natural law, or falsifiability, yet such theories have figured centrally in the development of their respective sciences. Moreover, demarcation criteria cannot justify methodological naturalism itself. Naturalistic evolutionary theories and competing theories of intelligent design or creation either equivalently satisfy, notice the, the distinction there between intelligent design and creation, either equivalently satisfy demarcation criteria or fail to do so. The truth about the history of life on earth cannot be decided by philosophical definitions. And I'd say amen to that. Given that no sound justification exists for holding a methodological Naturalism is a science-defining rule. Christians should not use it as a reason for adopting theistic evolution or excluding other theories. And that's the summary. The introduction, making the rules and playing the game. A young basketball fan today, say a 10-year-old boy growing up in San Jose, California, who religiously follows the Golden State Warriors and their star Stephen Curry, might be astonished to learn that the three-point shot wasn't always allowed in the NBA. It simply did not exist. 
But older basketball fans, such as the authors of this chapter, remember the game before 1979 when the three-point shot was first introduced. No three-pointers back then. A field goal from anywhere on the court yielded two points. Imagine yourself and as an NBA executive in 1979, the rookie season for both Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. You were seated in a conference room discussing the rule change that will allow three-point shots. You cannot envision that an entire strategy will develop around what happens when an arc is placed on the court, 23 feet and 9 inches from the hoop, at or beyond which three points will be awarded to a successful shooter. You just want to make the game more interesting, so you raise your hand to endorse the new rule. Now, were you playing basketball when you voted for the three-point shot? Of course not. The games themselves will take place in wholly different venues under circumstances that bear no resemblance to discussing rule changes in an executive suite. But your rule-making decisions will affect the future of basketball, indeed its very nature, namely how the game will be played, what skills will be valued, how teams will construct their strategies, and so forth. Let us draw a parallel. While making the rules of science is not the same as playing the game of science, that is actually conducting research, rulemaking influences the practice and content of science, shaping what it will be as an enterprise and a body of knowledge, including what kind of hypotheses its practitioners will permit themselves to consider. Science is something we humans invent and do. It has not been delivered to us, and we devise its rules, methods, and conventions. Moreover, the rules of science can change because, over the course of history, they have changed. But when might a rule need to be changed? In sports, rule changes usually occur when the quality of competition has stagnated or declined. Science is not a game in that exact sense, of course, but metrics of the success or failure of scientific theories exist, and we can ask the same questions at a deeper level about scientific methodology itself. Science should be interested in determining the truth, writes Caltech physicist John Carroll, who, by the way, is an atheist as far as I know. Whatever that truth may be, natural, supernatural, or otherwise, if truth is the ultimate goal of scientific investigation, then any rule that might, may keep us from reaching that goal needs to the closest critical scrutiny. In this chapter, we shall argue that historical biology, the science concerned with explaining how living things came to be, is long overdue for just such a rule change. More than 150 years after the publication of The Origin of Species, evolutionary theory has stalled out. As the preceding section of this book demonstrates, neither standard neo-Darwinian theory nor any of the other strictly materialistic theories of evolution recently proposed to supplement or replace it can explain the, novel, uh, the origins of novel biological form. And yet that was supposed to be evolutionary theory's main job. Many theistic evolutionists readily admit this. Biologist Daryl Falk, for example, the past president and currently senior scholar at Biologos, a group promoting theistic evolution, acknowledges that neo-Darwinian mechanisms cannot explain the major changes and innovations in the history of life. In his review of a book, Darwin's Doubt, written by one of us, Stephen Meyer, Falk wrote that the book identified one of the great mysteries in evolutionary biology today, namely the origin of animal form. He observed that this problem has never been addressed by neo-Darwinian theory. Ooh, never been addressed even. And he reflected on his own experiences as a college teacher of evolution discovering the shortcomings of textbook theory when confronted with explaining the origin of, for example, the first animals. He added that the process of natural selection, important as it may be in certain contexts, is not the driving mechanism of macroevolutionary change, and thus the mystery of the origin of animal life still awaits a solution. Calling the Cambrian explosion of animal life a big mystery, he also acknowledged that none of the newer evolutionary mechanisms or models adequately explain the novel, the origin of novel animal forms either. Referring specifically to these post-neo-Darwinian mechanisms, Falk admitted, Stephen Meyer is right that none of the other models fit the bill in a fully satisfactory manner yet. Yet, despite these candid admissions, Falk remains fully committed to some form of theistic evolution. Why? Methodological naturalism is the ground rule of science. 
Clearly, Falk's reason for remaining committed to theistic evolution cannot be strictly empirical. Given the currently available scientific evidence, evolutionary theory doesn't work, as Falk concedes. Rather, he remains committed to theistic evolution because of how he understands the rules of science to operate. Like nearly all theistic evolutions, Falk accepts the rule of methodological naturalism. Methodological naturalism asserts that to qualify as scientific, a theory must explain all phenomena by reference to purely physical or material, that is, non-intelligent causes or processes. Or as the National Academy of Sciences explains, methodological naturalism holds that the statements of science must invoke only natural things and processes. And that's a reference that I failed to put back up. The key terms here, of course, are natural, meaning the matter and energy of the physical world, but excluding intelligent causes or conscious mind, and only a logical modifier that restricts scientific explanations to whatever is natural. As Fuller, Theologi uh, Fuller Seminary philosopher and theistic evolutionist Nancy Murphy observes, methodological naturalism forbids referring to creative intelligence in scientific theories. Because of his commitment to methodological naturalism, Darrell Falk will not consider any theory, such as intelligent design, that invokes creative intelligence. Instead, he waits into the indefinite future for the formation, formulation of an adequate, strictly naturalistic evolutionary theory. As he explains, I see no scientific, biblical, or theological reason to expect that an intelligent agent might have acted discreetly or discernibly in the history of life. Natural processes are manifestations of God's ongoing presence in the universe. The intelligence in which I, as a Christian, believe has been built into the system from the beginning. And it is realized through God's ongoing activity, which is manifest through the natural laws. These laws are a description of that which emerges that which is a result of God's ongoing presence and activity in the universe. I see no biblical, theological, or scientific reason to extend that to extra supernatural boosts along the way. Fox's description of his philosophy and theology of nature is admirably clear. It amounts to the a priori conviction that during natural history, God acted exclusively through naturalistic or materialistic causes. Hence, we are justified in seeking only such causes to explain all phenomena, including the origin of fundamentally new forms of life and the information necessary to produce them. His philosophy of nature commits Falk to explaining all of natural history via what philosophers and theologians call secondary causes. But that is just another way of expressing a commitment, perhaps a distinctively Christian commitment, to methodological naturalism. Thus, for Falk and other theistic evolutionists, methodological naturalism compensates for the glaring evidential defects in the scientific case for materialistic evolution. Not by demonstrating the creative power of a previously unknown evolutionary mechanism, but simply by ruling out competing ideas, such as the theory of intelligent design, or even a divinely guided evolutionary process, where such guidance is empirically detectable. Under methodological naturalism, these theories fall outside what the received norms of scientific inference will uh, allow. In that case, a version of theistic evolution that does not involve God actively or discernibly guiding the evolutionary process remains as the only scientifically acceptable theory for theistically minded scientists. In this chapter, we evaluate methodological naturalism both as a normative ruling for doing science and as an extra evidential philosophical principle justifying theistic evolution. If methodological naturalism turns out to be a well-supported rule for governing the practice of science, then some fully natural process must explain the origin of life, plants, animals, and humans, and no other possibilities need or should be considered. Indeed, if methodological naturalism turns out to be sound, then theistic evolutionists may well be justified in holding the view that some fully materialistic mechanism of evolution have caused, the, there's a mistake there, I'm not sure why, ha, I, have caused new forms of life, even if evidence for the necessary creative power of knowing evolutionary mechanisms is currently lacking. If methodological naturalism is unsound, however, theistic evolution as a theory will need to stand on its own two feet without any philosophical buttressing. 
Then as we evaluate evolutionary theory without the protective philosophical armature of methodological naturalism, we may have to accept that there is no evidence showing that undirected evolutionary mechanisms have the creative power to produce new forms of life, as in fact we saw in chapters 1 through 9. In that case, scientists may wish to consider the possibility that a designing or creative intelligence played a discernible and causal role in the history of life and that such a theory may provide a better explanation than materialistic theories for the origin of biological form and information. After all, shouldn't the evidence, rather than an abstract rule like methodological naturalism, decide the outcome of a scientific investigation? Why methodological naturalism? So why have so many scientists, including many Christians, accepted that scientific explanations must involve only natural things and processes? Perhaps they are merely following the established conventions of their disciplines out of respect for the customary rules and practices of science, as those rules have come down to them through his, throughout history. As Nancy Murphy explains, most scientists accept methodological naturalism as an unobjectionable convention because seeking natural causes is just what science does. Science, qua science, seeks naturalistic explanations for all natural pos uh, processes. Christians and atheists alike must pursue scientific questions in our era without invoking a creator. Anyone who attributes the characteristics of living things to creative intelligence has by definition stepped into the arena of either metaphysics or theology. Yet, what determined the placement of the boundary line? For Murphy, the boundary we have today, which, as she notes, excludes creative intelligence or intelligent causation, is just the boundary that we were given by history. For better or worse, we have inherited a view of science as methodologically atheistic. Historical inertia, however, to give the inherited rules view a name, hardly justifies the methodolog methodological naturalism if we recall that the goal of science is truth. If methodological naturalism were only this type of historically contingent convention, scientists, scientists seeking true explanations could ignore the rule, especially if they believe the evidence is best explained by intelligent rather than by strictly material causes. The search for truth should override any custom or convention. Most defenders of methodological naturalism, however, insist that the rule is more than merely an arbitrary convention or the product of historical inertia. Instead, they insist that methodological naturalism is supported by sound methodological principles, by, independently, by independent and objective criteria of proper scientific methodology, or what are known as demarcation criteria. Demarcation criteria, such as the idea that scientific theories, one, must be based on observable data and or must be testable or falsifiable and or three, must offer explanations based on natural law, purport to distinguish genuine science from pseudoscience, metaphysics, or religion. Ariel, you probably remember these criteria. Defenders of methodological naturalism assert that only a fully naturalistic or materialistic approach to scientific inquiry and explanation allows scientists to meet these standards of good scientific practice. Conversely, they argue that non-materialistic or design-based theories that do invoke creative intelligence do not meet these criteria or standards of method and thus do not qualify as genuine science, scientific theories or explanations. So let us look closely at these demarcation criteria. Do they provide what is needed, namely a principled philosophical or methodological reason for supporting methodological naturalism? Do the criteria enable scientists or philosophers to define the practice of science in a normative way? Do the criteria justifiably exclude a priori some theories as unscientific or pseudoscientific, that is, irrespective of what the, of what the evidence may show? And wherever you see green ellipses, those are where I'm omitting material from the book. Four, a conversation about methodological naturalism and what wasn't said. On rare occasions in the life of a student, something so significant happens in conversation with an older mentor or scholar that the episode determines the future thinking of that student. Such a conversation happened to one of us, Paul Nelson, in October 1983 while he was still an undergraduate studying the philosophy of science and evolutionary biology at the University of Pittsburgh. 
the episode, a discussion about methodological naturalism with the distinguished historian of science, Ronald Numbers, as some of you may know, is worth recounting, and it illuminates the central problem with methodological naturalism, in particular with methodological naturalism's putatively objective standing as a ground rule for science. Numbers is a professor of the history of science at the University of Wisconsin and one of the world's leading scholars on the relationship of science and religion. In 1983, he received a fellowship from the Guggenheim Foundation to write a history of American creationism. He had learned that Paul possessed some historically valuable co correspondence and papers belonging to his grandfather, Byron C. Nelson, an influential early 20th century creationist. At the time, Paul was preparing to write his senior thesis in the philosophy of science on the topic of intelligent design in biology. For Darwin, design was not only a live possibility, but represented the central target of his one log argument in The Origin of Species. In other words, design might have been true. I can entertain no doubts, wrote Darwin, that the view which most naturalists entertain, and which I formally entertain, namely that each species has been independently created, is erroneous. But whatever can be false, erroneous in Darwin's words, could by logical symmetry also be true. The evidence should decide, except that methodological naturalism says otherwise. Never mind the evidence, design categorically may not be considered as an empirical possibility. The statements of science as a National Academy must invoke only natural things and processes regardless of the evidence. Over lunch, Paul presented this philosophical incongruity to numbers. Methodological naturalism seemed arbitrary at best, Paul said. If design can be false, as Darwin argued, then it might also be true. Whatever philosophy of science we adopt, therefore, should, be al should allow for both possibilities, letting the evidence determine the outcome, right? Without looking up from his food, numbers nodded his agreement, but only with the possibility of intelligent design. Of course, intelligent design is possible, he replied, but that isn't the issue. Look, he went on, why is it that in baseball, when one hits the ball outside of the first or third base lines, that is a foul ball, one cannot run to first base? <coughs> baseball has its rules, he said, answering his own question. So does science. Since the rise to dominance of scientific materialism in the 19th century, the, rule of science, the rules of science have included methodological naturalism. That may strike you as unfair, numbers acknowledged, but that is how the game of science has been played for a long time now, and it's not going to change. If you want to participate, follow the rules, or find another game. What struck Paul most powerfully at that moment, and what has influenced his thinking ever since, is what numbers did not say at the lunch table that afternoon. Demarcation criteria work, except when they don't. Numbers did not support methodological naturalism by appealing to any of the familiar and supposedly neutral methodological criteria used to define or demarcate science, such as observability, testifi uh, testability, falsifiability, or ex explanation by reference to natural law. He didn't even try. And there are good reasons for that. Historians and philosophers of science have long known that attempts to define science by reference to abstract demarcation criteria have failed. In particular, the attempt to define science normatively by such criteria has inevitably died by a thousand counterexamples. Many highly esteemed theories lack some of the allegedly necessary features of science. Demarcation criteria typically either exclude too much already established science, for instance, forcing one to disqualify as scientific major works in the development of physics, like Newton's Principia and his optics, both of which carry significant theological content and fail to meet specific demarcation criteria, see below, or inadvertently to cut the legs out from under current research fields generally regarded as scientific, such as cosmology, theoretical physics, historical geology, psychology, or even evolutionary biology itself. The failure of demarcation criteria became a public issue in the immediate wake of a famous court trial that was decided shortly before Nelson's conversation with numbers. In January 1982, federal judge William Overton overturned an Arkansas law um, 
requiring the teaching of creationism alongside evolution in the Arkansas public schools. To justify his ruling in the McLean versus Arkansas case, Overton cited demarcation criteria by which he claimed science could be defined normatively and against which creationism could be measured to determine whether it qualified as a scientific theory. One, being guided by natural law. You've seen these before, haven't you? Explaining by reference to natural law. Three, being testable against the empirical world. And four, being falsifiable. And others. Within months of the ruling, the adequacy of the McLean criteria and Overton's use of demarcation criteria generally had come under blistering attack from philosophers of science, with no sympathies for creationism, incidentally. No criteria comprehensively captured the features of science. To the exclusion of metaphysics, theology, or other knowledge claims, such that scientists, philosophers, or federal judges, for that matter, could decide if any theory was scientific without ever examining the relevant empirical evidence. Consider the second of Judge Overton's criteria, explanation by natural law. Larry Loudon, an expert, an expert on the demarcation problem and an atheist, could barely restrain his contempt for the dismal inadequacy of the natural law rule. To suggest, as the McLean opinion does repeatedly, that an existence claims is unscientific until we have found the laws on which the alleged phenomenon depends is simply outrageous. <coughs> Galileo and Newton took themselves to have established the existence of gravitational phenomena long before anyone was able to give a causal explanatory account of gravitation. Darwin took himself to have established the existence of natural selection almost a half a century before geneticists were able to lay out the laws of heredity on which natural selection depended. If we took the McLean opinion criterion seriously, we should have to say that Newton and Darwin were unscientific. And to take an example from our own time, it would follow that plate tectonics is unscientific because we have not yet identified the laws of physics and chemistry which account for the dynamics of crustal motion. Skipping a paragraph, in any case, natural laws are often used to describe but not explain natural phenomena. Newton famously declared that he did not know the cause of universal gravitation. Hypotheses non fingo, as he said in Latin, which means I don't frame any hypotheses. Conversely, many other scientists do offer causal explanations, but they do so not primarily by citing general laws, but instead by citing past events. Historical science, including evolutionary biology, for example, typically explain particular events in the past by citing prior events and conditions that played a causal role in producing uh, the ev events in question. And they give the example of the Himalayas, which we'll skip in order to save time. Or consider testability, another key McLean demarcation criterion. Judge Overton's ruling stated that creationism was not testable and thus could not be considered scientific. Ironically, just as the criterion of must explained by natural uh, law can be applied in such a way as to render both Newtonian physics and Darwinian biology unscientific, the criterion of testability can be rendered in such a way as to show creationism is a completely scientific research program. And that, of course, is what is done with uh, uh, soft sediment de deformation and... Uh, uh, carbon-14 dating and all of the finding of soft tissues in dinosaurs. Indeed, in The Origin of Species, Darwin built an evidential case against special creation by, precisely by testing and finding wanting the special creationist theories of his time. Consequently, by Overton's own rationale, creationism could legitimately be taught in public school science classrooms, contra his ruling. One measuring stick for everyone, the methodological equivalence of materialistic and non-materialistic, that is, design-based theories. Moreover, the failure of demarcation criteria to distinguish scientific from non-scientific theories applies in spades when considering materialistic versus non-materialistic or design-based origins theories. Hence, these criteria cannot justify methodological naturalism. While researching the demarcation problem, one of us, yeah, another one, Stephen Meyer, 
discovered an unexpected equivalence between materialistic and design-based theories with respect to their ability to meet a whole range of demarcation criteria. He has found that invariably, if the critics of non-materialistic theories such as intelligent design apply definitional criteria such as observability, testability, or law-like explanation in a strict way, then these criteria not only disqualify the design hypothesis from consideration of science, they also dis disqualify their chief materialistic rivals, other historical scientific theories that invoke only undirected evolutionary processes. Conversely, if definitional or demarcational criteria are applied in a less restrictive way, perhaps the one that takes into account the distinctive historical aspects of inquiry into biological origins, then these criteria not only establish the scientific bona fides of various fully materialistic theories, the rivals of intelligent design, they also confirm the scientific status of the design hypothesis and other non-materialistic theories as well. Theories invoking creative intelligence and their strictly materialistic rivals are equivalent in their ability to meet various demarcation criteria or methodological norms. To illustrate this equivalence in the cases of theories of biological origins, let's look at two widely cited demarcation criteria, one of which was used in the Arkansas trial and another that has been used by opponents of the theory of intelligent design, which was not yet on trial in Arkansas. Lawful explanation. We saw already that many scientific theories do not, cite, do not explain by citing natural law. Some do not offer explanations at all. They describe but do not explain using laws of nature. Other sciences do offer explanations, but they do so by reference to causal events rather than general laws of nature. Many historical scientific theories do not explain primarily by natural law. Instead, they postulate past events or patterns of events to explain other past events as well as to uh, presently observable evidence. Many historical scientific theories make no mention of laws at all. Laws at best play only a secondary role in historical scientific theories. Instead, events play the primary explanatory role. Ironically, as if to underscore this point, Michael Ruse, who offered the must-explain-by-natural-law criterion at the Arkansas trial, himself has noted that it is probably a mistake to think of modern evolutionists as seeking universal laws at work in every situation. Wow. Advocates of intelligent design use a law. Since there is no informational free lunch, the origin of complex specified information always requires intelligent input to justify their inference to a past causal event, namely the act of a designing mind. Observability. We have discovered a similar equivalence with respect to every other demarcation criteria that we have examined. Consider, for example, the off-sided criterion of observability. According to critics of intelligent design, the unobservable character of a designing intelligence renders it inaccessible to empirical investigation and therefore makes it unscientific. For example, in 1993, biophysicist Gene Kenyon was removed from teaching his introductory biology class at San, San Francisco State University after he discussed his reasons for deport the supporting intelligent design with his students. His department colleagues believed their actions against him were justified because they believed that he had been discussing an unscientific theory with his class. Some of Kenyon's colleagues argued that the theory of intelligent design did not qualify as a scientific theory because it invoked an unobservable entity, in particular an unseen designing intelligence. In making this argument, <coughs> Kenyon's colleagues assumed that the scientific theories must invoke only observable entities. Since Kenyon discussed in a theory that violated this convention, they insisted that neither the theory he had discussed nor he himself belonged in the biology classroom. And um, there's comments by Eugenie Scott of the National Center for Science Education and Fred Grinnell. But is that true? Does referring to unobservable entities or events render a theory unscientific? The answer depends again on how science is defined. If sciences, scientists and all other relevant parties decide to define science as an enterprise in which <coughs> scientists can posit only observable entities or events in their theories, then clearly the theory of intelligent design would not qualify as a scientific theory. 
But this definition of science would render many other scientific theories, including many evolutionary theories of biological origin, unscientific by definition as well. Many scientific theories infer or postulate unobservable entities, causes, and events. Physical forces, electromagnetic or gravitational fields, atoms, quarks, past events, subsurface geological features, biomolecular structures, all are unobservable entities inferred from observable evidence. Materialistic evolutionary theories also infer or postulate past unobservable events. Theories of chemical evolution invoke past events as part of the scenarios they use to explain how the first living cells arose. Neo-Darwinian biologists, for their part, have long defended the putatively unfalsifiable nature of their claims by reminding critics that many of the creative processes to which they refer occur at rates too slow to observe in the present and too fast to have been recorded in the fossil record. So they're not observable. Furthermore, the existence of many transitional and immediate forms of life are also unobservable. Skipping over a little bit, it has been said that behind every double standard lies a single hidden agenda. It takes only a smattering of philosophical training and even less historical sophistication to see that the flawed demarcation criteria cited in McLean had been specially contrived by the ACLU to try to discredit creationism. There is no philosophical shortcut to empirical truth. The permitted versus the possible. Science is an open-ended quest. Thus far, none of the arguments advanced in support of a naturalistic definition of science have provided a justification for methodological naturalism. Nevertheless, perhaps such arguments are irrelevant. Perhaps scientists should just accept the definition of science that has come down to them. After all, the search for natural causes or materialistic processes has served science well. What compelling reason can be offered for overturning the prohibition against design-based explanations in science? What harm can come from continuing the, with the status quo? In fact, methodological naturalism d damages science and for several interrelated reasons. First, with respect to origins, defining science as a strictly materialistic enterprise limits the ability of scientists to determine the truth, to find out what actually happened to cause life to arise on Earth. Consider, is it, a, it is at least logically possible that a personal agent or a creative intelligence existed before the appearance of the first life on Earth and that such an agent played a causal role in the origin and development of life. And those should be green ellipses. To insist that postulations of science, uh, pardon me, uh, postulations of creative intelligence are inherently unscientific in the historical sciences where the express purpose of such inquiry is to determine what happened in the past simply excludes by assumption a logically and empirically possible answer to the question motivating historical biology. What actually happened to cause life to arise on Earth? Skipping over a, a fairly large part of what they say, the asymmetry between the possible and the permitted as imposed on scientific by, science by methodological naturalism should bother theists and Christians most of all, including theistic evolutionists who have accepted methodological naturalism as design, defining science. Figure 19.1 gives the reason. For theistic evolutionists, the whole of reality is not and never could be coextensive with the physical or material universe. If the adjective theistic has any content in it, that is. Thus, not only is it possible that a personal agent existed before the appearance of, first appearance of life on Earth and before the universe itself came to be, um, rather, this is what theistic evolutionists take to be the case. There's a God out there. You're saying he can't do anything. And I forgot to put figure 19.1, which is just simply a small circle with what uh, methodological naturalism will allow, uh, natural causes and so forth. And then around it is uh, a, uh, a bigger circle saying of oh, what's actually out there. With an explanatory palette for science, pardon me, a, a, an explanatory palette for science without limit, Ironically, many atheistic scientists and philosophers of science now themselves reject methodological naturalism precisely because they see that it imp impedes an open-ended search for the truth about the universe and life and reality. 
As the Caltech physicist and atheist Sean Carroll, whom we quoted earlier, has explained, science should be interested in determining the truth, whatever that truth may be, natural, supernatural, or otherwise. We read that. The stance known as methodological naturalism, while deployed with the best of intentions by supporters of science, amounts to assuming part of the answer ahead of time. If finding truth is our goal, that is just about the biggest mistake we can make. Other atheists or committed scientific materialists now agree. Mathematician Jason Rosenhaus of James Madison University also objects to methodological naturalism as a non-negotiable first principle. Viewed as a fundamental ground rule to which science must always and everywhere adhere, he writes, MN seems dogmatic and unnecessary. <clears throat> University of Texas philosopher and biologist Sahotra Sarkar, himself a philosophical naturalist, worries that trying to rule out intelligent design in terms of demarcation criteria on the basis of methodological naturalism is both unnecessary and it seems to me a tactical mistake. Lastly, Belgian philosopher of science and atheist Martin Boudry, evaluating the status of methodological naturalism, argues that the most widespread view, which conceives of methodological naturalism as an intrinsic or self-imposed limitation of science, is philosophically indefensible. <clears throat> but why would atheists and philosophical naturalism worry about methodological naturalism? It is clear from their writings that Carroll et al. want materialistic theories of evolution to have prevailed in a fair competition, winning their place in a science because these theories explain the data better than any design-based competitors. As Sarkar stretches, uh, stresses, <coughs> natural philosophy <coughs> as well as naturalistic theories of evolution should be defeasible, that is, possibly wrong. Most importantly, he writes, since naturalism is derived from experience, it as well as any other phil philosophical position is fallible, just like the claims of science. Obje uh, objection, do not non-naturalistic uh, theories commit the god of the gaps fallacy. Defenders of methodological naturalism frequently justify its prohibition against non-materialistic explanation by claiming that any such explanation for the origin of new forms of life, such as intelligent design or special creation, would necessarily commit a god of the gaps fallacy. According to those who raise this objection, a god of the gaps fallacy occurs when proponents of design or creation invoke the activity of a designing intelligence or creator to explain some unexplained phenomenon or feature of the natural world. By searching for naturalistic or materialistic causes only, the objection continues, we avoid inserting god or mind or intelligence into the gap in our understanding, a gap that will inevitably be filled by genuine knowledge of a physical, material, or natural mechanism or process. But to what <clears throat> does the word gaps in this objection uh, refer? Imagine someone who mistakenly enters an art gallery expecting to find croissants on sale. That is, someone who thinks that the gallery is a fancy bakery where pastries and rolls are sold. Such a person may think he has encountered a puzzle about the wares provided by the business. He may even think that he has a gap in his knowledge of what must be, definitely be present somewhere in the museum. I cannot see the baked goods, so they must keep them in the back room. Clever minimalism. The moral of our little story, the gallery visitor sees an unsolved puzzle or perceives a gap in his knowledge about the location of the baked goods. Both the puzzle and the gap, however, de derive from his false assumption that he has walked into a bakery. In a similar way, perceived gaps in our knowledge of natural processes responsible for given phenomena Features of the world are based on our background assumption about the kinds of processes or entities that ought to be present in nature. In the debate about biological origins, theistic evolutions and mainstream evolutionary biologists assume that all living systems necessarily were produced by some naturalistic causes, process and their origin will thus ultimately have a completely naturalistic or materialistic explanation. Skipping a couple of paragraphs. Theistic evolutionists use the God of the Gaps objection to justify the claim that scientists should consider only materialistic evolutionary theories to explain the origin of new living forms. That is, they use it to justify methodological naturalism. Yet their use of the God of the Gaps objection to justify methodological naturalism up ultimately begs the question, why? Because the claims 
that gaps in our knowledge of materialistic evolutionary processes constitutes an actual gap in knowledge of how life forms came to be assumes that naturalist, materialistic evolutionary mechanisms must have produced new forms of life and thus must explain the origin of these forms. But that is simply the assumption of materialism, met metaphysical and methodological, in another form. Yet methodological naturalism or, or materialism or naturalism is precisely what theistic evolutionists invoke fear of the God of the gaps fallacy to justify. Skipping a couple of paragraphs, in, seen in this light, the God of the gaps objection fades into insignificance. To have force, theistic evolutionists must first show that we have genuine gaps in our knowledge of materialistic causes of the origin of new forms of life. That is, we have grounds for thinking that present gaps will ultimately be filled with knowledge of an actual natural process or mechanism capable of biological innovation. But this, as we showed in chapters one through nine, is exactly what evolutionary biologists and theistic evolutionists have failed to do. Indeed, if theistic evolutionists have discovered materialistic processes with demonstrated creation, uh, creative power, or if they had empirical grounds for thinking that such processes do exist, they would not need to invoke methodological naturalism or justify methodological naturalism by warning of the God of the gaps fallacy nor would they need to declare their commitment to waiting indefinitely for an adequate materialistic evolutionary explanation for the origin of biological novelty to, observe, uh, to emerge. And that goes double for the origin of life itself. Instead, the fact that they cannot justify their confidence that some materialistic evolutionary processes will ultimately prove sufficient to explain the origin of novelty means that they don't know that there is a gap in our knowledge of such process that is, of an actual process at work in nature, either now or in the past. Indeed, they have no grounds for believing in the existence and causal powers of such a hypothetical process, apart from their prior commitment to methodological naturalism, which is the very principle they seek to justify by invoking the specter of the God of the Gaps objection. Conclusion. We have seen that there are no neutral methodological criteria by which we can define science normatively and exhaustively. But fruitful science does not need definitions. It needs creativity, hard work, and evidence most of all. We have also seen that special, uh, specific demarcation criteria fail to distinguish the scientific status of materialistic and design-based theories of biological origins. That is, the proposed justifications in support of methodological naturalism fail. In addition, we have seen that there's a strong affirmative reason to reject methodological naturalism. Namely, that it hinders the truth-seeking function of science by forcing science to reject the possibility that a creative intelligence played a discernible role in the origins of history of life, even before experience can freely testify. Methodological naturalism gives nothing to scientists but intellectual bondage and li limited options. Even if the authors of this chapter were atheists, we would not want to work with the chains of methodological naturalism around our ankles. Nor should theistic evolutionists. They will lose nothing by letting go of this wretchedly bad rule, erasing a philosophical boundary that never should have been drawn in the first place. But whether they do so or not, <clears throat> it should now be clear that there is no compelling reason to accept methodological naturalism and every good reason to reject it. Consequently, there is no reason to continue holding to theistic evolution in the face of the mounting evidential difficulties that now confront all theories of unguided evolution. It may well be time to consider alternative types of causal explanations for the origin and development of life, to consider, for example, the possibility, at least, of intelligent design and its explanatory power. And why not? Basketball is better with a three-point shot. More fun to play, more fun to watch. Now, my take on all this, those who are familiar with the philosophy of science are aware that the demarcation problem, what is science, is particularly thorny. Many people say it can't be solved. It does not make philosophical sense to try to rule out intelligent design by trying to prove it is not science when you can't even define science well. It also does not make philosophical uh, uh, sense, uh, that, that's my mistake, to assume naturalism is true and use that assumption to rule out the supernatural. 
That is why the term methodological naturalism was invented. It was supposed to be neutral philosophically, but insisting on methodological naturalism is precisely philosophical naturalism. Ruling out God of the gaps argument is only fair if one knows there is no God or that God will not interfere, which makes ruling out those arguments circular. But that's my opinion now it's your turn. We have a couple of questions here and a couple of them here. Um, why don't we pass that back? Just a historic incident. When I became pastor of the Madison, Wisconsin church and my wife was working on her doctorate at the university, Ron Numbers was there as well. He issued a public challenge to any creationist that he would debate and demolish them. Well, we arose to the challenge, found a creationist whose name I no longer recall, and prepared for the debate. Ron Numbers backed out. He said he wanted nothing more to do with Seventh-day Adventists. Interesting. That's uh, coming back there. That... Thank you. Um, I was very interested in what determines the line of demarcation. To me, it appears that the two books that were referenced, uh, primarily the Bible and the origin of species, are misunderstood, misinterpreted, and misused, beginning with um, Genesis chapter 1, where it says that God created or he created <laughs> Elohim, not God created the heavens and the earth when you read the Hebrew. You, you start off with a whole new, um, you pivot on the entire interpretation of the Bible. Also, the origin of species was meant to um, help people to understand the means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races. That's the original title of the book. The title was changed to help it, to help more people to accept the concept that he was actually trying to convey. So the misuse of the Bible, the misuse of this book, not as bad as the misinterpretation of the information that's inside of each book. The misinterpretation of what's inside of the Bible, when you read the Hebrew, starts off with, we don't know the age of the earth, don't argue over it. We don't know the origins of many things, but we know that our Father created the heavens and the earth, but there was destruction and then there was the creation of Adam and Eve. So he recreated the heavens and the earth so that they were habitable for us. Just so many other things to consider. The, the discussion actually doesn't center around that particular point, though. Um, what they're asking is, can God intervene in nature or do things differently than he usually does, or however you want to phrase that? Um, and that's the real question. And methodological naturalism says we have to do science as if he doesn't. And philosophical naturalism says he doesn't because he doesn't exist. Theistic evolution that is non-ID friendly says he doesn't because he can't interfere mm -hmm. in the laws he already created. And those are reasonable positions to start with but then you have to start explaining data. And to rule out the idea that he does before you even look at the data is really allowing philosophy to override the evidence. And that's really what these people are talking about. One of them believes that there's been a long time uh, before uh, the biblical story of Adam and Eve Another one believes there's been perhaps six days or five days, whatever it comes out to be, uh, before the story of Adam and Eve. But they both understand that philosophical point, and that is that, that God can intervene in nature. And really, that principle, if I can put it that way, basically tries to make science safe for atheism. 
And I don't think that's the function of scientific rules. Comment over here. I think there are a couple of them here. Yeah, I, I just might add to the comment about Ron Numbers. He used to be a member of the faculty here at this university. Uh, the uh, there's very little to argue against in this in this presentation here. It's uh, uh, you know I tend to grief almost everything there. I uh, I wonder a little bit. Uh, obviously, uh, materialistic observation period is very uninteresting. You just have a few facts, and you can't you can't speculate because well, that's you're out of observation. Uh, very dull science if you're just counting uh, uh, leaves on a tree and you can't say anything about it. Uh, and so most science, you know, they don't follow material, materialistic naturalism. It's, they, they go beyond that, uh, and that's what makes science interesting. Uh, but uh, so you open the door, and then you start dealing with... Uh, Animism, for instance, ideas, you know, that people have uh, about objects and uh, impart various ideas to, to that, which is, you know, uh, uh, opening the door of materialism, uh, uh, naturalistic materialism and so on. So you, uh, ideas that, uh, well, I might even get into one more controversial uh, there was no death before uh, sin on the earth. We'll come to that in this book, which is uh, interesting. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, so on, uh, ideas that certain genes in uh, uh, jellyfish can improve your brain, uh, this type of thing. Uh, how do we deal, once we open that door, how do we deal with uh, controlling uh, rampant speculation against truth? Uh, that's something you need to watch here once you've opened that door. Now, the scientists claim that they've kept that door closed and they're deceiving themselves. This is not the case at all. But... Uh, it is something that you need to watch uh, as you uh, open this door that uh, you uh, not have rampant speculation. Um, metaphysical ideas and so on uh, can go very wild. And uh, uh, it seems to me that you... I, uh, well, you tend to come back to more solid facts uh, than, uh, at least I would say for animism, I certainly uh, would like uh, more solid facts and so on. Uh, uh, what, is, what is the game? It certainly is not defining science by, as material, the naturalistic materials. That, that's not the game. What is the game for finding truth? Uh, and is it, I tend to say, I think, you know, we, we, we fall back on observation. Rather, uh, I, I tend to fall back on observation as, as, as the game. Uh, because that data seem, that seems more reliable, more consistent than rampant speculation, uh, metaphysical speculation, and so on. Uh, uh, I like some consistency. Uh, Anyway, that's, that's, I'm just speculating here. Well, if I can uh, make one point, the biggest advance of science was the idea that we couldn't figure out everything without looking at nature itself. God had freedom to make nature any way he wanted to, which means if you want to find out what the universe is really like, you have to look at the universe. 
And I think that's the uh, single most important uh, foundation of science. And uh, the corollary to that is observation trumps theory. And what that means for an idea like a mythological naturalism is that unless you can establish it by observation, the observation trumps that theory. And in fact, going further than that, um, that one has to be continually open to the idea that maybe observation hasn't established methodological naturalism as an absolute principle. And so while I think it's a kind of a general rule that's, that's not, uh, not bad, a rule of thumb if you want to call it that, you know, when we first hear a phenomenon, we don't think of uh, supernatural events to begin with. I think that at a certain point, when one has ruled out enough uh, natural causes, that one one may start to think that maybe this is an area where the supernatural has intervened. And uh, you know, if you have a man's body that disappeared. And everybody says they see they've seen him walking around and talking, and it's really him. Uh, then at some point, it 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 starts to be reasonable to say maybe he was resurrected. It's fascinating to to hear this review. Uh, let me use an example. I'll just say at the outset, for the way I understand uh, materialistic naturalism, I'm very thankful for. In your world, if a drug is going to come onto the market, you don't want to base its acceptability based on testimonials. And I've been hearing testimonials on both sides during your complete presentation. People are defining this term in a way that they can criticize it. At its most hard-nosed, it will, in current use, it will discriminate between a drug that is effective enough to risk using it on human population because it's extremely hard-nosed. Uh, testimonials mean nothing. Uh, another definition in part of this, God of the Gaps. God of the gaps only is a reality if you believe that if you understand it, God didn't do it. That's, right. That's crucial. And both sides create, you know, uh, these definitions in order to be able to use them. Uh, in my uh, world as a practicing science, uh, this methodological naturalism or materialistic naturalism, if you will, is extremely useful in trying to get good information published. And I think in understanding that if you, if you can't come to a clearly supportable objective conclusion based on your data, you have stepped outside of methodological naturalism using a really limited view of methodological naturalism means you have to go beyond it. Big deal. Well, one of the things that I'm thinking of is, um, you know, there are various uh, things that have been found. Uh, living organisms uh, in Permian material, uh, mat uh, dinosaur uh, bones that have... Uh, apparent uh, actual tissue still in them after supposedly millions of years. Um, and th those, th those items have been judged by various biological and, and uh, chemical criteria. Um, and the criteria that are, you know, the, the laboratory procedures assume that God isn't fooling us in our labs. 
And so in one sense, they're being judged by methodologically natural, uh, naturalistic criteria. But on another, on another level, you can say, but we can test and see how long biological materials should last, and there's no reason to believe that they should last millions of years, let alone 65 million years. Same thing is true for carbon-14, for example. And if it's, uh, you know, if it's there but it's not supposed to be there, and both of those criteria, both of those conclusions are reached by, um, by a procedure that allows methodological naturalism, then you have a conundrum. And the easy way to solve that conundrum is to simply say, well, maybe it isn't as old as it's cracked up to be. And so I see, you know, methodological naturalism is something that is reasonable to assume as far as you can. But I think that there, there does come a breaking point. And when we get that breaking point, we should acknowledge it rather than trying to fight harder and harder. I think that the origin of life, for example, the, the field is just horribly uh, confused. Um, there's really no good theory of the origin of life at this point. And I don't think that is anybody that really disputes that seriously. Precisely. And I, I would posit that uh, if all, everybody were using a really hard-nosed version of mythological naturalism, they would be willing to say, uh, the, the evidence I have only goes so far. I've got to step beyond this to put it in a context that makes sense in yeah. whatever picture they're building. I think that's honesty. Yeah. Now, if you want to define science as coexistent with mythological naturalism, then what that's saying is that some evidence invites you to step outside of science. And that's, that's legitimate. What I don't see is to say, oh, but science is the only way to find truth. Methodological naturalism is inherent to science, and therefore creationist, intelligent design, any idea that there's a supernatural gets to be ruled out before we even start. I think that's a very poor philosophical procedure. That's, that's only valid if you define methodological naturalism in this very broad mechanism. In other words, they're stepping beyond <clears throat> the evidence to make a statement either way. Yeah. Um, it occurs to me that while this discussion is dealing with intelligent design, it it doesn't really um, it it almost sounds as if it is trying to rule out all intelligence, but that would almost rule out the entire forensic science, for example, which is specifically uh, geared and oriented to working out who did it and how was it done. And uh, who's responsible? And things, questions of that nature, all of which uh, we still consider very scientific. So why is it that in that context, intelligence is admissible, but in other contexts, which we know far less about, it is not? Uh, it, 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 it begins to be a bit of a puzzle. It's as if, uh, a, 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 and here is the, the, the really big conundrum, when you think about the scant little bit of information available on the basis of which some <clears throat> forensic conclusions are drawn, with a great deal of confidence and compare that to the amount of information that is stored in the DNA of every cell's nucleus and ask a simple question, 
How did that amount, that volume of information, that sheer enormity of information get there and still speak of a lot of intelligence here and zero intelligence here and consider oneself serious in this contemplation I find this uh, practically preposterous it's, it's as if one has to be a politician and not a scientist at all to be entertaining these kinds of concepts at the same time. Did you want to say something? Sure, we'll pass it up here. Let's give him the mic here. I'm thinking that what we have been discussing about today about the uh, methodological naturalism, trying to define what the scientific method means. But I think we all have summarized and agreed that the forensic science proved that the scientific method is not scientific. <laughs> <laughs> That's a <better> statement. <laughs> well, uh, uh, yes. The and forensic science proved that the scientific method <laughs> is, is not, not scientific. scientific. Uh, well, certainly not scientific in that sense. Uh, go go you ahead. Did, you didn't understand that? Let me say that one more time. The, the forensic science proved that the scientific method is not scientific. Well, I, what, I would, what I would rather say is that, the, that the forensic science proves that the way people use methodological naturalism is not really valid. Because once you have, once you allow intelligence into some part of science, and I think forensic science is in fact science, then what it suggests is that naturalistic as opposed to intelligent causes, cannot be the major dividing line. Uh, in fact, if I were to have to propose a criterion for science, I would say it is the study of the reproducible, and that allows for if if uh, if a, a theological proposition can be shown to be reproducible then what you have at that point is actually theology can be a science. <laughs> Just a minute, we'll, we'll, we'll give it to you again. A lot of things are not repeatable. They're observable but not repeatable. So this is where forensic science is important. Well, then that's the, the example of basketball would be a wonderful thing. Uh, as a counterexample to our, your argument, is how do you reproduce the same game the same way? There, there's zero chance of that happening. Okay? Creation is not repeatable. Yeah, creation is not repeatable. Yeah. However... Or even like the event of Karakatoa or some of the things. Yeah. However, if you can see creation that rep that uh, that is the same general type of phenomenon that is repeated in different areas, then I think you can say that it, creation is repeatable. I, I think that when Ellen White talks about the science of salvation, that she's not just being facetious; that she actually is talking about if certain things happen, you surrender your life to God or somebody else does, or somebody else does, that there's something that happens that is reproducible in, in general outline. Uh, just like if we drop things off of a table, it may be one ball, it may be another ball, it may be a, a, a third ball with a different density. Um, they will follow similar projections as they fall off of the table. And it's a physics experiment that you can do and you will find that as long as the balls 
weight ratio to their resistance is small enough um, that they will follow a very similar pattern. And that, of course, leads you to the uh, to a natural understanding of acceleration and a, a law of gravitational attraction. If you repeat it on top of Mount Everest, they won't fall quite as fast, and you can actually measure that. But they will still fall, and it'll be pretty close. If you repeat it in various other, er you know, various areas, you'll find that there's a slight variation if you're near mountain and so forth, they fall at a slightly different angle and so forth. But all of that, uh, it, is, it is close enough that you can establish a kind of a general law. And, you know, if you, if you go to the moon, which we've now done, and watch and see that the falling happens, but it happens at a different rate, and it's predictable upon the mass of the moon and the diameter of the moon um, uh, that uh, you're, you're doing science at that point and even though it isn't precisely reproducible it's close enough reproducible to where it's reasonable to call it science and for that reason even though uh, forensic science is perhaps not uh, precisely reproducible in that way, there is a, an underlying scientific uh, uh, pattern to it. And methodological naturalism, in essence, is simply a, uh, if it's a rule of thumb, it's a rule of saying, let's ignore God inside of our laboratories, which I think is fair. Um, if it's a, an absolute rule for every event in the universe, then it becomes philosophical naturalism, uh, in fact, if not in definition. And philosophical naturalism is simply the attempt to, or pardon me, methodological naturalism is, if it's ad adopted as an absolute rule, is basically saying, if you do science, you must make atheists comfortable. Inculcated into our children in this classroom to say that that is the only science, uh, then the definition of the scientific method should be revisited. Yeah. Well, the you know the the definition that was taught way back when, and that I st think still has merit is, you make a hypothesis, you say what your hypothesis predicts, you go out and you test it and then you revise your hypothesis depending on what the tests are or maybe even throw it out depending on how bad it is. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, that's the strength of science. It's not that we use methodological naturalism per se. And what's happened is that the strength of science has been kind of, if I can put it that way, hijacked to serve the purposes of excluding God from nature entirely. And I think that's wrong. Yes? It seems to me the, uh, the suggestion of methodological naturalism that it's you know, whatever you can observe and so on. Of course, we know it's not followed, but uh, the idea tends to prevail to a certain extent. And you can ask the question, is that not an arbitrary level at which to define science? You could redefine science as you accept only that which you can smell. And uh, that would be an example of arbitrary definition. And I would say that Methylon and I drew the line at a certain point which tends to exclude God. Uh, nothing says that there's not truth beyond that. Uh, so that uh, it is a somewhat of an arbitrary line. It's a convenient one that gets rid of God. Uh, 
But it certainly is no criterion for finding truth. Well, if if God exists and you have, and you say we're going to deal with something that doesn't include God, then um, obviously you're not uh, dealing with all of reality. Um, of course, scientism kind of likes to say that science is all there is, or at least all that is important that there is. Yes. Uh, as a non-scientist, uh, I am having a new enlightenment about methodolo- methodological naturalism today. Uh, it seems to me that all this business about the God of the gaps and how that's such a bad thing, uh, God of the gap, our methodological naturalism is just the flip side of that. I mean, whenever you come up against a thing that you don't know understand you just plug in your your theory and and it's exactly the same thing and how can how can these two sides criticize each other i don't understand that well uh, some sometimes that's been referred to as the evolution of the gaps which uh, says that if you can't explain it on an evolutionary basis well just wait it'll it'll get here and and really that's basically uh, the flip side of the God of the gaps. The question is, if you don't have all the evidence available, then uh, are you going to assume that uh, some God did it, or are you going to assume that there's some natural process that can explain it? Um, and these people will say, well, you should assume that there's some natural process that can explain it. And that only works if either you know God doesn't exist or you know God wouldn't do that. And, you know, knowing God doesn't exist is a bit of a stretch. And knowing that God wouldn't do that, in in my opinion, is even more of a stretch, especially when most of the people who do this would admit that uh, that, uh, Jesus was resurrected. So God does step into history so why can't he step into prehistory? Yes. Whenever there is some kind of interaction between um, unequals, there is always um, lots of opportunity for plenty of misunderstanding and misconstruing and misinterpretation and such like. Um, The Old Testament is rife with it. Um, And when Israelites were going through the desert, they had the pillar of cloud by day and of fire by night, and yet they clamored at Moses as if it was Moses' fault that whatever happened, happened. They had repeated uprisings against Moses as if he's the one who's guiding the pillar of cloud or fire either way. No amount of evidence was sufficient to dissuade them from their convictions in the matter. And no outcome was sufficient to change their view of things. Whether God himself intervened and proved the matter or not, they still blame Moses. Isn't isn't that an interesting observation? Mm -hmm. So the question the question that arises in such circumstances is why is that the case? We have similar situations sometimes as a conflict between student and mentor. And and you look at what's going on and, and you think like, so a mentor's patience is interpreted by student as, he hasn't done enough for me. <laughs> um, you know, um, 
And if the mentor actually does intervene, or you're trying to dictate to me how to think, I mean, uh, is there a safe place? You, you try one thing, you try another, you hope that at some point a light will go on and some learning will happen. But there is no a priori guarantee that any one intervention, however well-intentioned, is going to have that outcome. And, and this is true with students, with younger people, as well as older people. When we are determined to see things a certain way, we can always find a justification for continuing in our viewpoint, no matter what evidence is there to contradict it. And that is the frightening thing. If I recall a passage from uh, the first chapter in Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, it talks about how Jesus tried to counsel Lucifer while there was still an opportunity for him to avoid the, um, shall we say, the ultimate downfall. And all the kindness and courtesy and care with which Christ tried to counsel with him. Lucifer interpreted as weakness. Ah, this whole thing doesn't add up to much. I can really prove that I'm strong enough to accomplish what I aim to accomplish. It is fascinating how things can be interpreted when one is willing to interpret them a certain way. Well, you, you see the same kind of thing in the history of Elijah. He's just done a demonstration that the Lord, he is God, that the people accepted. And Jezebel's re reaction is not to say, oh, you had it right after all. It is to say, no, you're going to be dead man by tomorrow. Right, and and the same thing is true of Jesus and his resurrection. Yes. The 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 temple guard, and it was probably the temple guard, not actually Roman soldiers that made the guard that guarded the tomb, because they reported to the high priest. Uh, and there was such a thing as temple guard, and that's why uh, when um, uh, Pilate said something that can be interpreted both ways is probably best interpreted as you have a guard make it safe as you can so the temple guard comes back to them in in even if it was roman soldiers somebody came back to them and said look this is what happened, this is what happened. and the the high priest instead of saying oh no we goofed it he really is the messiah they go listen just tell everybody that the disciples came and stole the body you know, you're just going, <laughs> obviously, these people are not about to let a few facts get in the way of their theory. And if there's anything that science has to say, it is that you'd better let the facts get in the way of your theory. Otherwise, you won't find the right theory. Just a minute. Uh, let's get your comment because I can't hear it. I'm, I'm not quite as good a hearing as I used to be. So. so on the basis of that statement, does science have need of God? Does God have a place in science? If it's fact-based, can we ever prove or disprove his existence? If we wish to continue learning. So if it's observation-based, um, we operate on, well, I at least, operate on the perception that 
you know, we seek to understand him, but we, we can never fully understand him because he's just above us, beyond us. Is it wrong that we exclude the search for God from our scientific pursuits? Well, as we'll talk about next week, there's actually two ways of doing this. One of them is to say science is a limited enterprise and it doesn't involve God. But in that case, one has to say, well, science is a limited enterprise, and if God exists, we're going to have to move beyond science in order to understand all the truth. The other way of saying it is that true science will go after the truth regardless, and therefore will be open to evidence for God. Um, and either one of those will allow you to find truth, either admitting the limitations of science or defining science in such a way that it can, in fact, uh, interact with every other form of knowledge. In which case, uh, I personally prefer the, the latter to say that science is not completely closed off from everything else. That's why the failure of the demarcation criteria that's been noticed by philosophers of science for a long time and so if it is open to the possibility of God, then, um, then it has to be a little bit careful about what it dictates in terms of the possibilities. Well, I think that that's probably enough for today, and um, I'm going to encourage you to come back for next week for the uh, second part of this, where it will be approached in a slightly different uh, way, but uh, the names will change, but the entities will remain the same.